Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. I'll just start again. Um, I can tell you a little bit today about some work from earlier this year uh, with Jason Pollock, Moshe Rosali, and David Wickham, uh, as well as some work in progress right now, sort of much more preliminary with Arjun Carr, Lampros Lempra, and Moshe Rosali. Um, so let me make sure this is all working. There we go. Okay. So I'd like to address sort of two large questions in my talk today. The first question is a question that I'm certainly not alone in asking in this workshop, or maybe more properly a conference, I guess, when it's this big. Uh, and that's what's the role of Euclidean wormholes in isolated unitary theories of quantum gravity when there's not some, say, theoretical ensemble to integrate over. So of course, we all know that, you know, if we're doing the path integral, say, with two boundaries, there are both disconnected and connected contributions. And, you know, we usually like to talk about these connected contributions as some ensemble average or some contribution in some sort of third quantized baby universe Hilbert space. But if I'm going to sort of tell you that we are going to strictly sort of confine our attention to some single theory, we want to know sort of what are the role of these uh, Euclidean wormholes and what are they calculating for us? Uh, the second question is a question I think that I sort of haven't heard discussed as much in this workshop. And that's sort of how do we understand the different gravitational contributions to calculations with similar boundary data? So what I've drawn here are sort of two different gravitational computations we might do. The first one is what we might think of as some uh, ensemble average of uh, the, uh, say the partition function squared, and it has some connected contribution. And the second picture is something we might get if we talked about uh, some auxiliary system that we uh, coupled to our gravitational system, uh, and then say calculated here the trace of rho squared for that density matrix. And in both pictures, we sort of have sort of two circular boundaries, say both of length beta. And so you might think the sort of gravitational contributions to both of them are the same, but we know that these two uh, calculations have, have different answers. They're not equal to each other. And so we might ask why do the contributions we get on the left-hand side not equal the contributions we get on the right-hand side, despite the fact they sort of have the very naively the same sort of geometric boundary data. So uh, some answers to these questions that I'll give you very briefly right away. Um, of course, uh, as it's no surprise, uh, the answer is that Euclidean wormholes are still going to be relevant to computations in a single isolated theory. Uh, and although I sort of you know, phrased my talk as gravity without ensembles, I want to say there's still the result of having an ensemble description or maybe equivalently having some sort of baby universe Hilbert space. Uh, the difference, of course, is that it's an ensemble that's determined sort of intrinsically within the theory, uh, determined by the coarse, the limited sort of coarse grained measurements that are available to physical observers in some single theory. And by physical observers, what I really mean is observers sort of with some uh, finite lifetime. So this is sort of very different, I think, than thinking about some theoretical prior where there's an ensemble determined not by the you know, measurements of observers, but by some sort of theoretical prior, some bias we have, or some class of theories we're interested in. Um, so that you can view this really just as a special case of the, you know, of this, uh, that sort of more general story and, and sort of all the papers that are the impetus for this whole uh, workshop that we're having here today. Uh, for the second question, how do we understand these sort of different gravitational contributions to calculations similar boundary data? Uh, what I wanna argue is that you can view the gravitational solutions as solutions that have the same ultraviolet boundary conditions, but have different infrared boundary conditions. And I'll explain sort of towards the end of my talk what I mean by that, what I mean by sort of different infrared boundary conditions. So just a quick outline. Uh, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about what I mean by sort of a, some gravitational effective field theory and how that leads to a notion of ensembles and an ensemble intrinsic to the theory. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the sort of moments of correlators in this EFT, which we think about as being sort of some, having a dual description as uh, gravitational saddles. Uh, and then I'll, that'll be sort of the bulk of the talk. And then we'll end with some further thoughts on boundary conditions and sort of the difference between what one might call UV and infrared boundary conditions for as a gravitational calculation. Um, 
So maybe I'll just stop for 30 seconds right here and see if there's any questions before I sort of get into the heart of things. Okay, great. So why does thinking about gravity as an effective field theory lead to a notion of ensembling? Well, usually when we're sort of thinking about the, the sort of standard notion of effective field theory, we're usually thinking about, you know, uh, doing a calculation for low energy experiments sort of near the vacuum of a theory. And in that context, it's very, you know, very natural to think about integrating out energies that are much greater than the sort of relevant energies of the experiment we're doing. But of course, black holes and gravity are sort of a very different setting. So there we're concerned sort of explicitly say with energies that are large, say at order the central charge of some CFT. Uh, at the same time, the entropies are large, or order C, and so the level spacing, say, in some band that we're concerned with is very small, you know, they're exponentially small in C. And if we're uh, concerned with, say, observers who have only finite lifetime, uh, then the sort of, you know, they're unable to do the experiments that would be necessary to distinguish between uh, being in one microstate or another microstate, you know, naturally we think these would take sort of E to the C times. And so then there's sort of a notion that there's an effective field theory that should describe these finite time observers where we integrate out large times that are inaccessible to them. That is, we integrate out the microscopic level splittings of the theory. And so uh, what we'd want then is some EFT that describes, say, not uh, observables in some particular high energy microstate, but the average or typical properties of microstates. And so then we're sort of naturally led to the notion of an ensemble that the things we want to calculate in this EFT are averages over all possible microstates that we could be in. Uh, we could attempt to be very sophisticated in how we uh, coarse grain over these level splittings. Uh, maybe sort of like uh, we heard earlier in this week from Julian on uh, Monday. Uh, but of course, I, I think one can capture sort of all the relevant phenomenology and sort of all of the sort of, you know, at, at a broad level, sort of all the interesting physics just by thinking uh, very naively about just taking our Hilbert space and dividing it up, sort of binning the Hilbert space. So we take a whole bunch of energy windows, which will sort of denote the mean energy in each window E, and then uh, there's some sort of very small width about that energy, but still wide enough that we have some large, say, exponential number of states in each window. Uh, let's begin by thinking about some single, say, microcanonical window. This, yeah, oh. There we go. So uh, we can think about the states that are of interest to us in our effective field theory, not then as particular states in this uh, window, but states that are say drawn randomly in this window. And the way that we're gonna do that formally is just thinking about uh, each state as being described by some random unitary drawn with the Haar measure on the space of all unitaries in this, uh, on this Hilbert space and then just acting on say some fiducial state space, some fiducial state phi naught. Uh, and so the ensemble averaging we'll do will just be say integrals over these unitaries, these choices of unitaries. And we're gonna denote this ensemble averaging just by this over bar notation here. Uh, just because the sort of angle brackets that we might use to denote uh, expectation values, we're gonna continue to use for the regular quantum expectation values of sort of the underlying microscopic theory. Uh, it'll often be the case that we want to talk of say about not one randomly drawn state, but we're gonna do a calculation that has many independently drawn random states. So I might then have a calculation in some set of independent draws from this distribution. And then say I'll index these independently drawn states with some index i. And so for example, we might ask about sort of the mean overlap between two independently drawn states here. Um, interestingly, it's not letting me change my pen color. So I'm gonna have to draw everything in red, I apologize. I accidentally erased the U there. Um, so here, if we have two independently drawn states and we're just doing two independent averages over two different unitaries, uh, and one can just do these uh, unitary averages and you just find then that these states are on average are uh, orthogonal to each other, but uh, hey, stuff keeps disappearing, I apologize. Uh, I'm not intending for those to, to go like that. Uh, the, the norm square of these states on average is uh, almost orthogonal, but there's these exponentially small overlaps between different states. Uh, 
I'm not going to attempt to describe today sort of an entire effective field theory, but I really just want to talk about the moments of this ensemble, that is sort of the, the typical values of uh, correlation functions, which I want to think of as sort of describing the saddles of this effective field theory. So the first class of observables in such an effective field theory are, are the mean or typical correlators. So here, what I've written down is just some uh, expectation value for some operator is the mean expectation value for some operator where we're looking uh, between two different states or possibly the same state. And this is just given by some unitary integral. And one finds, maybe not surprisingly, that the answer you get is just the sort of uh, explicit uh, microcanonical average. An important uh, related example is something that I'm going to call the approximate partition function, where instead of, say, summing over the e to the s exact microstates or the exact energy eigenstates uh, in this uh, microcanonical window, I'm going to sum over e to the s randomly drawn states. And you may think this is sort of a relevant notion of an approximate partition function where sort of the right thing to calculate if you're, say, your system, if, if we're doing this sort of a thermal case where the system hadn't uh, completely thermalized. Uh, and so the expectation values of states was not sort of exactly proportional to their energy, but there is some fuzziness. So you can calculate uh, the average of this approximate partition function, and you get just what you'd expect. You get sort of the exact microcanonical partition function, which I'm just going to denote by Z1. Of course, we also want to get higher moments of correlators in this effective field theory. So instead of just the mean of uh, some correlator, I can take the mean of some product of correlation functions. Uh, this has two contributions to it. The first thing is sort of the obvious mean squared piece. Uh, but there's also, in addition to that, There's some connected piece. And it's connected because the two operators, instead of being take it traced independently, have been traced together in some connected trace. I put in the middle here some little star just to note the fact that the product of these operators uh, is only contracted within this microcanonical window. And so you can think, you know, instead of this little star, you could think there's just been a projector that's been inserted there that projects onto the relevant energy window. So we can think of some, you can think of the, the average now of our approximate partition function squared. Uh, and it has this nice property of, okay, well, first, you know, as you expect, there's just the uh, microcanonical partition function squared. But there's also this connected piece. It's a connected piece that's very small, but it's there nonetheless. And as a second example, uh, we can think of sort of a microcanonical toy model of the sort of second Renyi calculation that I was interested in. So here is some uh, density matrix where I just sum up e to the k um, states in some auxiliary system uh, where their outer product, the coefficients here, are just determined by the overlap of some random states. So again, it has the exact same structure as the calculation for the partition function. That is, we have the mean squared piece and we have this connected contribution. The difference, of course, is that there's different numbers out front here and here. And these different numbers mean that while in the case of just the partition function squared, I always had some very small connected contribution. Uh, here, the connected contribution can be much larger or at least as large as uh, the disconnected one. And so if we calculate just the second Renyi entropy, you know, this is, you know, no surprise, this is sort of exactly the same calculation that was done in the earlier work of Pennington et al, that there is uh, some initial phase, which is where you're dominated by the uh, disconnected piece. And then there is some phase transition 
to when you're dominated by the connected contribution. We can also build some simple uh, dual gravitational description of these contributions, at least when uh, our window is sufficiently large. Uh, so the, the disconnected pieces are always built out of just the trace of some operator. And so we can think in the, the gravitational description that these traces are just calculated by the standard uh, disk contribution, the standard, uh, say, Euclidean black hole. So here I just have the operator and on the boundary and inside I'm going to just note the black hole just by this or the disk contribution just by this sort of blue uh, color inside. Uh, the connected contribution also has a very simple gravitational description, at least when uh, our microcanonical window is sufficiently large. Uh, all that it does is instead of the operators living on some separate boundaries, those boundaries have been glued together into some single boundary and they live on opposite sides. So for example, the sort of gravitational description of the mean of the partition function squared has the sort of piece we might expect, which is just the product of the two disconnected pieces. And then there is this connected gravitational contribution where the operators live on the same boundary. Uh, there's also slightly more. Um, there are some sort of smaller e to the minus s corrections, which one might, one might want to think as sort of, sort of more topologically non-trivial contributions where there's, you know, sort of say small bridges that connect these different pieces together. But here I don't really have a, a good gravitational description for these yet. This is just sort of a, a heuristic picture of how one might want to think about those extra contributions. Uh, I'll say that one could play the exact same game with higher moments that we did here explicitly for the second moment. Uh, you know, they, and they evolve similarly contributions that link subsets of the copies together by gluing them all onto some single boundary. And there's nice sort of simple Feynman rules that compute these contributions for you. So let's just do a little assessment of where we've gotten to so far. So we have our ensemble description of our single theory. We're averaging over energy. And what it's given us is that it's given us connected contributions to the moments of typical CFT correlators. Uh, these connected contributions have a, a nice gravitational description, at least when that window is larger. Uh, and these, these gravitational pictures, we've connected the boundaries together in, in a way we might sort of think is reminiscent of the uh, Euclidean wormhole story. But there's some sort of big downsides about what I've done so far. Well, first of all, uh, these gravitational contributions were only sensible when we averaged over a largish energy window. Um, and there's a little tension there with the sort of original motivation where these windows are meant to be small, that the states are meant to be indistinguishable to uh, low energy observers. Um, also, the, there was an entropic weighting of the contributions that was not determined by the gravitational geometry. So if we go back a slide, when we were doing this calculation and you want to calculate the mean of Z squared, there's both the gravitational piece, but there's also this piece out front here and here and here, which sort of tell you how much to weight these individual pieces. And the geometry didn't tell that for you. And so that's a little bit in tension with this idea where we we do the calculation just by summing over gravitational geometries that fill in the given boundary conditions. And then lastly, one more downside, uh, that's that the connected contributions have different boundary conditions. So as I've been saying, uh, the connected piece really takes the theory that live on two different circles and glues those circles together. And so if we wanted to think about the connected Euclidean wormholes as being different ways of filling in the same boundary conditions for the gravitational theory, this doesn't really seem to work anymore. So these are the, the sort of three questions or three downsides I'd like to try to fix in the second half of my talk. Uh, the first thing is very easy to fix. We can just go to a canonical picture. That is, you know, this is a problem because we are forcing ourselves to work in the microcanonical picture, but that was sort of just tying our own hand behind our back. And so there's no reason we need to do that. Let's just go to the canonical picture. And now uh, we're going to try to reinterpret all our calculations where this is the, the 
the part out front is sort of part of the gravitational calculation. And we're going to just fix the boundary conditions and ask, having made these different changes, if we can reinterpret the solution we found as some contribution not with these different boundary conditions, but with the original boundary conditions we started with. Any questions uh, so far before I move on to that? OK. Not seen any uh, We do have a question. Oh. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Quick question, Jamie. So these further exponentially suppressed corrections that you had, yeah, they come because you're doing a very precise Haar average, right? If you had sampled the states slightly differently, would you, you would not have gotten this second line here? Is is that correct? Um, in certain cases, things in the second line here can be of equal, say you know, something down here. For example, there's calculations where the thing down here is sort of the same size as the thing up here. So they're not always sort of smaller. They're definitely, they're always smaller compared to the, uh, the sort of naive thing that they're decorating as in this one is smaller than this one and this one is smaller than this one. But it, it's not, there's not always some sort of clear separation in, in, in size between them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, partly. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So instead of computing the microcanonical partition function, let me just write down for you the, the thermal equivalent. So here, all I'm going to do is now sum over all of my energy bands. Uh, and each energy band, I'm going to pick e to the s random states, and then I take the square of that, or rather I'll take a product of two different temperatures. There's no reason they have to be the same, and take the mean in this ensemble of those two. Here are the contributions. So there's this first one, which is just, of course, the, the mean squared, which is the one we expect. Here is the sort of connected trace. So here's one connected piece. One thing you should notice, though, is that it doesn't build for you the uh, sort of normal uh, connected trace of the of e to the beta 1 plus e or times e to the beta 2, that this is sort of broken down into a bunch of sums over energies, because the random phases can only uh, add up coherently within each en energy band separately. And so you don't get uh, all the contributions that would build for you the full trace. Uh, in a very similar way, the piece that was sort of a small correction to the disconnected piece is here actually connected. Because although they were disconnected within each energy window, uh, they're correlated with each other when we sum over the energy windows themselves. And, and there's some other correction to this one as well. So there's some, another connected piece here too. And so what I want to do, uh, I maybe won't get, I won't do all of them, but let me go through each of these contributions and ask, is there uh, a gravitational picture, a, a gravitational contribution that's consistent with each of these pieces where I fixed the, the boundary data to be the original boundary condition? Uh, so we want to sort of determine what the, the geometry looks like. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that exactly. But we can try to do is sort of find some heuristic characteristics of the geometry and ask sort of what, what, what sort of scheme of geometry each of these contributions would be compatible with. And so uh, one thing that I can ask is, you know, one, one characteristic would be is that if there is some, say, connected geometry that still has some rotational symmetry, then I expect that the action has this form, which would lead me to conclude that uh, the entropy, at least at order C, is zero. Uh, and so conversely, if we find some order C entropy, we might expect that there is no uh, geometry where the thermal circle does not degenerate. So 
if I go and look at say the, the saddle point that dominates one of these contributions and I find there's some order C piece, I can conclude that it's unlikely there is a geometry of this form. It's also often the case that if we're computing uh, one of these contributions, we can think of it as uh, evaluating the operators in uh, some expectation value of some entangled state. Or here it's an entangled state, you know, normally say if we're doing like the, you know, the thermophil double, it's an entangled state between uh, two, two copies of the theory between a left and right copy. Here we have four copies. There's a left and right of the, the first system and a left and right of the second system. So I'd have some sort of uh, form state of this schematic form. And then I can sort of ask by sort of the sort of RT type reasoning, uh, what are the entanglement entropies between those different copies that would be uh, compatible or characteristic with different types of geometry. So this first example, which is sort of just like the, the uh, mean squared contribution, you know, we'll have some large order C area at the, at the tip of each of these disks, which means that there is some um, order C entanglement entropy between the left and right on either side, uh, but that there is some sort of smaller, maybe order one uh, entanglement entropy between the, the two copies of the theory. Uh, if I had some picture like this, uh, sort of double trumpet geometry, what I conclude is that there is some order one entropy between the left and right because they're not geometrically connected to each other when I look at the t equals zero slice, but that there is some possibly order C entropy between uh, the, the you know, system one and system two because there is some you know, area contribution I have to cut to separate them here. Uh, and then the third possibility is just that the entropy is order one when I look at either the left and the right or between uh, system one and system two, which you can think of as sort of like just two copies of you know, thermal ADFs with possibly some uh, non-geometric entanglement between the two sides. And I'll just note, you know, there seems to be some, well, maybe this is too strong. I, I wrote fundamental incompatibility, but okay, there's, there's some tension here with having uh, some large uh, Euclidean wormhole that would be a saddle, which would suggest that the entropy is order C when I look uh, at the entanglement between the two sides, uh, while the rotational symmetry of such a solution would suggest that uh, there should be no order C entropy, that the saddle shouldn't have some uh, large entropy that dominates it. So it suggests, you know, in, in this picture that uh, having some large entanglement between the two sides always wants to contract this Euclidean wormhole and, and pinch off the thermal cycle. So uh, this is to be sort of the very coarse uh, geometric reasoning I'm going to use to look at these different contributions and decide what type of geometry is compatible with them. So the first contribution was just the squared partition function. And so here everything is you know, just standard. We, we understand what the gravitational description of these partition functions is. It's just this disk contribution. And so we just have the two copies of that and everything is normal. Uh, this first connected contribution looks a lot like that above uh, squared term but we only get contributions when the energies are the same in each copy that we've sort of taken, it's the diagonal contribution over energy. And so there's sort of a, a coarse grained way of writing this where uh, where I can just view, instead of thinking about the uh, exact traces, I can just sort of rewrite the trace as just uh, some mean value of the operator in that energy window and so this can be then written as just the sum the, or the, the sort of thermal weighting of those mean values where uh, there's no entropic contribution here because of this e to the minus 2s in front, which works to exactly cancel that out. And so it, because it's independent of the, the microcanonical entropy, you might think that there is some rotational symmetry to the solution. We can also rewrite this expectation, the expression as the expectation value in some state. So here is that state. Um, it looks at first like 
it is sort of the regular thermal field double on each side, say that there is some entanglement between the energy eigenstates on you know, each side, but it's different in, in sort of two key ways. Of course, there is the fact that it's diagonal in the entropy across the two copies, but also that each, uh, each sort of uh, microcanonical window has some suppression in the entropy. And what this means is that uh, when I look at either the splitting between the left and the right or between the two copies, in both cases, the entropy is just is small as order of c to zero. That's because although you might've thought there was some large amount of entropy you generated from uh, entangling the microstates, the entropic suppression just cancels out. It means that that, that particular uh, entangled state has some small factor in front of it. And so really actually one can sort of think about, one can sort of heuristically think about the state as just uh, some thermal weighting of uh, some sort of like GHZ like state between the four copies where uh, there's no ent entropy and we just sort of sum over the energy. And so the sort of geometric picture that one can write down is sort of this uh, product of uh, thermal ADS type solutions where we have some non-geometric uh, order one entanglement between sort of the four different parts of this system. So here there is no uh, geometric bridge that links the two sides. Um, let's move on to the trace term, where they, this is sort of the, the, the one that would have been the, the trace in the microcanonical picture that linked the two sides explicitly. Um, we can write down again the coarse grained perspective, and we find again that it's just some thermal weighting of some order one covariance of the operators on the two sides. So again, this contribution has conspired such that there's no uh, contribution from the entropy. This calculation is blind to the entropy of the system. And so you might think that this has rotational symmetry again. Uh, we can do the same thing. We can rewrite this expression as the expectation value in some state. And this state has uh, order one entropy between both the two copies of the theory as well as sort of the left and right halves. Uh, in fact, the state has sort of just done something where it's switched. It's, it's morally the same state except we sort of switched left and right. And so, I'll say, you know, it has the, the sort of the same geometric picture where again, we have this thermal ADS or, you know, sort of schematically thermal ADS solution with some order one uh, entanglement between the two sides. Uh, we can do the same thing for our thermal density matrix. So we can just generalize to some appropriate, uh, slightly random thermally entangled state. Here, when we compute uh, the trace of rho squared, on average, we actually find a connected contribution that builds not the sort of funny trace we found before, but uh, the proper trace over the whole Hilbert space of e to the minus two beta h. And so this solution, we could obviously just join the two boundaries together where they form some larger circle of uh, length two beta. But we could also play the same game we were doing for the partition function squared, where we try to think about fixing the asymptotic boundary conditions. And that sort of works to some extent, where we can really, you can really just think then about sort of cutting and regluing the, the circle, the gravitational solution where the circle of length two beta into two circles of length beta, and thinking that this is just some sort of entangled state between the four copies. This picture works for just sort of the naive partition function with no operators inserted, but it breaks down. So it's unstable to inserting operators. That's because if I insert some operator, the energy say that's going around sort of one side of the circle here and the energy here are not the same. And so it means is that there sort of has to be some, although we might've thought uh, there was some IR way of gluing these two boundaries together, this sort of has some cut that extends all the way to the UV that necessitates that uh, these theories are glued in the ultraviolet so that if there's energy two going around, say the top of the circle on the, in the system one, it's the same energy that's seen by the, the system on the other side. So one way to understand that is when 
the correlations are too strong between the two theories or the just two replicas, they can no longer be sewn together in just the IR and must be joined in the ultraviolet. And that's especially true when, when the correlations are, are linking different energy bands together. So why do we have two different pictures for the same contribution? Well, let's think a little bit about why we had to join uh, the two theories together into a single boundary when we were, thinking, when we were first considering this, uh, this connected trace. That's because if we are in the connected trace, if we are looking at uh, the matrix element of operator, say, A in some microstate, in some eigenstate EI, we had to link that together with the same matrix element of the operator B in that same microstate. So the two operators were joined in, in the UV because we wanted to pass identical microstates between uh, one copy and the other. But you, know, you might say that fine-grained microstate data isn't accessible to simple operators near the boundary of ADS, right? There's no, there's no simple way of measuring which microstate you're in using some simple ultraviolet operator. Uh, and so you might say that for, if we're doing sort of simple expectation values, we might equivalently share that same microstate of data in the IR geometry. That the only thing the ultraviolet needs to know about is the energy. And that which precise microstate can be encoded into something not near the boundary, but sort of far in the infrared of the, the geometry. A five minute warning, Jamie. Okay. So I'll say more generally, I want to think of all of our contributions sort of taking this general form where I, I think about there is some trace and there is some uh, operators here, say here it's e to the minus beta h, which I want to think of some UV operators, defining some UV boundary condition. And these sort of are the things that are telling me about the sort of relevant uh, uh, alter the relevant geometry near the boundary of the gravitational theory. Uh, but in addition to the ultraviolet boundary data, we also need to supply infrared boundary data. And here we can think about them as sort of uh, these sort of infrared projectors. And the infrared projectors, and in, in particular, the entanglement of these infrared projectors are the things that determine the way these geometries are joined together in the IR. So these projectors onto uh, microstates or eigenstates that I want to think of as IR data, and as long as they're sufficiently typical as measured by simple operators, and we're not probing them with sufficiently complicated operators, then they might have some simple coarse grain geometric interpretation like I've drawn here. So just for example, uh, in our particular calculations, you know, you can think of the just sort of naive uh, mean squared, the disconnected piece is just something where the, well, okay, we don't need to put a projector here, really, I'm just inserting the identity, but we're inserting some projectors onto microstates here, it's just the projectors one, and they're completely uncorrelated with each other. But these other various contributions that we just discussed can be thought of as you know, some infrared sums over projectors that are correlated between the two copies. Uh, and as long as these projectors that I'm inserting are sufficiently uh, weak and do not sort of change the uh, UV data, then they might constitute some sort of coarse grained infrared geometry. So let me just summarize. So what I've argued is that there's a distinguished notion of ensembling in an isolated unitary theory, which is determined by physical observations that are accessible to finite lifetime observers. Uh, this coarse grained effective field theory can describe uh, moments of typical microscopic correlation functions. They are described by connected gravitational geometries that tie copies of the theories together. Uh, and we can think of the different gravitational contributions that arise as determined by some infrared boundary conditions. And these infrared boundary conditions determine how the different copies are, are linked together. And so let me stop there. <laughs>
All right, thank you very much, Jamie. So I'll uh, ask everyone to um, to unmute so we can uh, applaud. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take questions. Uh, go ahead, Ben. Um. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah, I think this idea is so is very nice, and uh, it's so nice. We've been kind of working on some follow up stuff, and uh, just a brief comment. So, I think in your uh, in your micro canonical story, um, I think it's even a bit worse than what you said because uh, in the story of of Merolf, the window needs to be wider than the temperature scale, and then the probabilities should be, you know, given by the Boltzmann factor inside that window. So I think it doesn't quite match up with what you have there. But on the other hand, I do think that that can be fixed up um, more along the lines of your, of your original story where you know, the second moment is being calculated by a simple gravitational, uh, you know, by a thermal field double correlator by considering a certain kind of weird ensemble of pure states that's sort of canonical in a slightly different sense than what you had here. Um, because you know, basically you have a lot of choices, right? You, you're defining some ensemble of pure states here. Um, and I think with some choices, you do get simple uh, gravitational correlators. But maybe as a question, yeah, have you, have you thought about some other choices for ensembles of pure states and what kind of diagrams those would give? Uh, Jamie, you have to unmute yourself. I'm oh, sorry, I don't know how I got muted there. Um, no, I, I haven't thought about other ensembles. I mean, so we, I mean, obviously the, the right ensemble to be averaging over is determined by, well, both by your theory and by sort of what, you, what your observer is. And so, you know, we were sort of making some assumption of sort of, I think very naively sort of like sort of maximal chaos assumption that the right Sort of states to um, to average over are just completely random in some energy band, um, but there's obviously sort of more intelligent ways to do that. I think that's a very coarse, in the same way that just sort of dividing up the Hilbert space into bins is you know far too coarse to actually sort of give you the precise thing you want. And I haven't thought really in depth about sort of sort of more more clever ways to do that. But I, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the sort of precise answer you get will sort of depend on precisely what it what how you've designed to find the ensemble to average over. So I, 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 I mean, I'd be very interested to hear more about what you guys are doing. Yeah, hi, Jamie. Thanks again for the nice talk. Um, there's just a clarification question that uh, that interests me. So I, I, you said something that your IR reasoning uh, allows you to rule out these wormholes as saddles. Would you mind clarifying that a little? I found it very interesting to me. Yeah, I, I, I think you know, in in the cases we've looked at, it, it's always the case that these saddles can be ex or, or the all these connected contributions can be explained by sort of an order one entanglement between the sort of two replicas of the two different copies of the theory. And so they don't, the, the, there doesn't seem to be, uh, there, there are no contributions where I'd, well, I'd say there's some order C entanglement between the two, a, a, except you know, the, the only time it happens is when we make the entanglement large enough and then this thing wants to pinch off and actually join the two boundaries together. So it, and, and this sort of sort of naive reasoning where you just say, well, you know, imagine, at least in the cop the case of two copies, you know, if there is some sort of large wormhole, you'd expect it to have some rotational symmetry. And this sort of just a, well, naively suggests that there shouldn't be some order C uh, entro entropic contribution to the, to that saddle. So I, I don't, in, in these sort of simple cases, I, I, it seems sort of incompatible to have that, have a saddle with that sort of large wormhole geometry. I mean, I think that's not a problem. I think in most cases, people, when thinking about these, aren't sort of saddles, but are, well, yeah, they're, they're not. They're not solutions, but one sort of just right. Yes, Let, let's say let's call them half saddles. But you can't 
preclude that option. No, I don't think anything I said would apply there. I mean, the sort of the reasoning I use, I think, applies sort of strictly to it if one thinks of this as a saddle, at least as far as I understand it. So, okay, thanks. Hi, Jamie. Um, I, I was just curious. Uh, you said felt reminiscent of Hong's talk this morning. So I was just curious if you'd thought at all about uh, um, to what extent there's a relationship with your thinking about things in the way that Hong and Trio were thinking about things. Yeah, so I, I definitely think there's a lot of similarities between the way Hong is thinking about things and we are. Unfortunately, I was not at Hong's talk this morning. I have to get my kids ready for school in the mornings. So I always have to watch the morning talks uh, time shifted later in the evening. So I don't know exactly what Hong said this morning, but assuming it's like previous talks of his I've heard, yeah, I think we're, we're really saying the same thing in a slightly different words. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Beautiful picture of Vancouver, by the way. It's, it's not what it looks like outside not, right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's raining, it's been raining for weeks. I just wanted to clarify something, Jamie. So at some point you had like the wormhole picture and you were talking about entropies and and states. And that's a bit confusing to me because I don't really know how to take the wormhole picture and think about the entanglement entropy of what state you're computing because that doesn't have a clear CFT representation in some sense, if you know what I mean. Well, I, I guess, I mean, so what I did was show that my averaging gave sort of, you know, contributions that were described as, you know, sums of traces between the two theories. And so one can just view those as entangled states. You're not in an entangled state, but one can view those as being computed by some entangled state. And then one can ask if, if that, what are, what are the entanglement entropies in that entangled state? And Okay. So it, it, it's, it's not, they're not, it's not related to the states I started with. They're just some auxiliary states I'm using to compute those traces. See, I see, I see. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, all right. Uh, oh, Raphael, um, let me unmute you. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Um, I just have a question about these privileged observers um, or this, this, this criterion that you're using to distinguish one class of observers from another. Uh, how would you define that in asymptotically flat space where you know, there's no scale as in de-sitter or anti-de-sitter? Um, and also we could have arbitrarily high entropy in the asymptotic region that would have nothing to do with black holes, might be quite trivial. Um, what would set the scale there? The thing I'm using for the scale is determined by the, the lifetime or the, the time scale of the experiment. So, I mean, if you're going to let your observers live forever, then they can obviously do very fine grained experiments. They can say measure lots and lots of Hawking quanta. And then, you know, I, I think that leads to a breakdown of this picture that I'm talking about. Well, what I'm asking is, um, you know, you can perform any fine grained experiment uh, in some finite time. And um, I thought that in ADS, you were going to say, sure, but it will take an exponentially long time, perhaps, compared to the ADS time scale. Um, because the argument I'm making is that if you have some energy splitting, that's like e to the minus c or you know e to the minus some large number, then the, the time scale one associate with sort of distinguishing between those microstates is e to the large, that large number. So it's an, it's, it takes exponentially long to uh, distinguish between those two states. Yeah, so in that language, I think what I would say that in, in asymptotically flat space, that energy splitting is always zero. And so you would, you would not be able to perform any experiment if you restrict to observers who, who can't resolve um, you know, the spectral density. I mean, I, I, I guess true. So I, what I'm saying is I'm assuming there is some underlying microscopic theory where there is some finite, where there is some discrete spectrum. But that can't be the case in asymptotically flat space. No? Yeah, so this becomes even harder if one assumes the spectrum is not discrete. That then these things are sort of 
at the get-go that they're not they're not uh, resolvable in any finite time. Well, I don't think that's true, right? We we don't believe that we cannot uh, perform a quantum mechanical experiment in asymptotic exact space. We do that all the time, and we have no trouble checking what the final state is. It's a well. Yeah, maybe I should think about this some more. I mean, I think certainly what we're going to do in, in asymptotically flat space too is we're going to say we're going to limit the, the computational ability of our, our our simple observers. We're going to give them access to say simple uh, simple classes of operators to make measurements, and using those things, it's going to restrict our ability to distinguish states. I think that'll certainly be true in flat space as well, and. Uh, given what, whatever sort of operational way you want to talk about the accessible measurements, that's going to lead to some notion of ensembling. And I, I think it's not a problem that notion of ensembling is sort of observer dependent. Yeah, it's just that I think you would lose the connection with, with states that are produced specifically by black hole evaporation. You could worry about this in the context of any, any okay. state of some radiation in the asymptotic region. Yeah, I'd have to think about what the implications of that would be. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Nori. Hey, uh, great talk, thanks. Um, yeah, about uh, like Lafayette's, what Lafayette was saying, the black hole in asymptotic space, as flat space, should be viewed as kind of finite dimensional system uh, in uh, confining a zone. So that, uh, and all these uh, affine mode or soft mode, I say, is, uh, exponentially dense in that. So the time scale you compare is a time scale of the temperature, which controls the coupling of this black hole system, which is confined within a zone, the coupling weakly to the external system, <laughs> and you're leaking in the form of the Hawking radiation. And that time scale is in a short shield case, it's M. And then within the window of one over M, you have exponentially many. So you have to cause grain that you can never be able to observe anything in, in that time scale. In, in that precision. So it's a finite dimensional system. Coupled so, to couple to infinite dimensional system weakly. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the way to view. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. All right, I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Um, and if there isn't, then uh, let's go ahead and thank Jamie one more time.